Okay, I think we're here. We're recording. And um, thank you all for coming. Um, I'm Cindy Bink, and I'm the HEO Cross Campus Chapter Chair. I, um, we're going to be having a discussion today on the 10 demands that the PSC is putting forward to CUNY um, that are that are strong demands and we want to talk about how this affects HEO. So I, um, I'm going to do some, we're going to do some introductions and then we're going to get into it. But I'm uh, the Director of Counseling at City Tech as well and I am a HEO. And so uh, why don't we start with John, you want to introduce yourself? Well, hi, I'm John Gallagher. I'm a HEO who uh, manages some of the technology at Burbank Community College. Very good. And, and Anselma. Hi, I'm, uh, I'm Anselma. I work at Brooklyn College. I started many years ago, but right now I'm the Associate Director at the Graduate Center for Workers' Education and Community Liaison for Brooklyn College. Marlene. Hi, everyone. I'm Marlene Girone. I'm a HEO at City Tech. I work for Campus Services, and I serve as a delegate, and also I serve on the EC. Very good. And Samina. Hi, I'm Samina Shahidi. I'm an academic advisor for the Urban Studies MA program at the School of Labor and Urban Studies. Also happy to have served as a delegate. Great. Larry. Hi. I'm Larry Boskett, um, HEO delegate, been at Brooklyn College. Uh, I work as the assistant director of admissions at um, the admissions office at Brooklyn College. It's been doing that for a number of years, so um, real excited to be here. Very good. And Mary? Mary, you're mute. <laughs> um, I'm Mary Murphy. I'm associate director of the Counseling Center. Um, and I'm also a, uh, an alternate delegate to the PSC, and uh, on, on, on the campus, I'm on serve on College Council Executive Committee and a number of other committees representing the HEOs, um, including the Screening Committee and um, uh, uh, HEO um, Steering Committee, uh, which we meet uh, regularly to discuss issues on the campus. Um, yeah, that's, that's me. Very good, and Renee? I'm Renee Freeman Butler. I'm from LaGuardia Community College. I'm a HEAL delegate. Um, I am currently responsible for credit evaluation and transfer um, services to four-year institutions. I've held a number of different positions and diverse um, roles at the college during my tenure there um, and serve on a number of committees, including the reopening committee. Good. Cindy, you're muted. Janet. How about Hi. you? Hi, I'm Janet Winter. I work at John Jay College in Public Safety. I'm the Vice Chair of the HEO Cross Campus Chapter. Um, I'm a delegate. I'm on the Executive Committee of the Union. I'm happy to be here. Great. And Iris? I'm Iris Delutro, and I'm Vice President of the Cross Campus Units. Uh, proud to say I've been in that position since 2003. Before that, I was a Chapter Chair, and later on, Chapter Chair again. Delegate, NYSE Board of Director member, um, AFT, U T AFT, NYSE, and Executive Council member in the bargaining team and the legislation committee team. Great. So, so as um, you, as you all know, that this we are recording this session for us to talk about the HEO demands that the PSC has put forward. They're going to be shown on August 26 during a 24-hour period to really highlight the needs of CUNY and to advocate for PSC members. And so, I guess uh, we're going to be talking about the the ten demands. And um, you know, for those of you that you know, haven't realized we have gone through a CUNY, an amazing transition since March. Most of our employees are working from home, but the union had to fight very hard to get them to come home. Um, and um, there are concerns about funding for CUNY. Um, our university, as you know, caters to students. It's a public college. And so issues of income and, um, and sort of class issues 
uh, are affected, affect our student body. And it also affects us because we are losing money at CUNY and we can't educate people. So we're gonna start with some of the, um, the um, 10 demands and I'm gonna ask Anselma and Merlene to talk a little bit about the first three demands and then all of us will, will chime in. So Anselma, you wanna talk about Save Lives? Yes, I like to speak about Save Lives. Uh, I work at Brooklyn College, but I also have traveled practically to all of the campuses. And I can say that one of a, an immediate concern, including Brooklyn College, is the clean, cleanliness of the place. Uh, and, and before COVID hit us, many of us were concerned about bathrooms, for instance, how clean they were. I'm at 25 Broadway now, and we are in very close quarters. So I think saving lives means do we have a safe place to come back to? And also, I know that heels work really many, many hours. So through the years, I've seen people suffer, their health suffer. I think it's because of the stress that it comes from working those incredible number of hours. And that's a concern to me that now under this, under the, uh, this new situation, people are working even longer hours. Uh, so it, it's a rich concern, it's a big concern of mine that we really save lives, not only from having a place that is COVID free, a virus free, but also the number of hours that we are working, which causes a lot of stress. And I could go on, but I'm going to let um, my next colleague talk about it. Yes, thank you, Ansela. I would like to continue talking about that in terms of preconditions that we had at City Techs and other colleges around CUNY. Our buildings were are very dirty and unkept. And at City Tech in particularly, we had a lot of molding situation. And our concerns are with the dirty buildings and poor ventilations pre-COVID and we had some water damages and temperature issues. We want to know what's going to happen when we, when we have to return. And we have a lot of concern after, during COVID, how the disease is transmitted and what CUNY is going to do about it. Can I yes. add something else, Cindy? Uh, yes. the, you know, right along with that, uh, some of the, um, the physical uh, layout for many heroes. Uh, and you know, I always financially, is, I'm very, it has a special place in my life because my heart, because that's how I started. The people are on top of each other. Mm -hmm. And even in, in the counseling units, uh, there are some counseling units that even before CUNY, uh, COVID hit, I was wondering about, you know, things of safety and, you know, because the quarters were so people are so close to each other that it really affects people's health, you know. So talking about save life, this is something that we have to look even beyond COVID, but especially now that being in such close uh, order can mean someone can get infected and, and the health can be impacted. Yeah, I think that um, when the chancellor wrote a note saying that there would be possibly people coming back, I think that it created a wave of anxiety for so many HEOs that they were afraid that they were gonna, going to have to go back to an environment where they would be infected with COVID. And I think this is an ongoing fear that people have. Um, I think, Mary, you were raising your hand. Uh, yes, on that very point, uh, when you think of there's the counseling centers, but there are also the registrar's office, academic advisement, um, bursar, all of these frontline offices that are dealing individually, staff are dealing face to face with students and, uh, and customers. And, uh, you know, there's going to be a need for more than just masks and gloves and such, right. and, you know, cleaning and, and disinfecting. There have to be screening and space 
adequate space made available for people who want to interact on a personal basis. So, you know, it, they, I, I, I've heard nothing about that. I, I mean, I, I know the basic things are for CDC is masks and cleaning and regular cleaning. Although when you think about it, there's not very, uh, you know, off, uh, colleges don't really have the staff to do this kind of work. So it's uh, like everything is needed, but who's going to do it? So, John and then Renee. Yeah, I mean, I, I hate to get back to the bathroom thing, but at BMCC, our bathrooms have the same kind of traffic that you would have at an airport. It's impossible. I mean, our cleaning staff is great. I mean, we have to give our cleaning staff, the DC 37 people, a lot of credit. They work really hard, but we couldn't keep our bathrooms clean at most of our campuses before this happened. And I don't think they've at, I, I don't think they're adding more cleaning staff or training them or giving them the materials to handle this. So all you need is one infected person to go into one bathroom with poor ventilation mm -hmm. and you're gonna you could infect a hundred people. It, it, and at City Tech, I hate to bring it up, I never use the bathrooms at City Tech. <laughs> <laughs> really chat. So, so I'm going to ask, um, I, listen, I've been all over the university and there's lots of campuses that have problems, but Renee's next and then Iris. So uh, two points I want to make. One is that I, I see that there's a difference between cleaning and disinfecting. That's right. And so I think that's going to be critically important to understand what specifically is going to be due to the building. So they, one, yes, they need to clean, but two, they need to disinfect and they need to have the proper um, tools as well as disinfecting cleaners to do that. The second part of it is as we move from phase one in the fall, based on whatever anyone's reopening plan is, to the next phases of um, integrating more people on campus, I'm wondering, is there any conversation about vulnerable populations? Because do we actually okay. find a, a vaccine that works and that has been tested on sufficient numbers of people so that it's significant, we're still going to be vulnerable. And then you still will have vulnerable people who may be called back and should not be put in a precarious situation where they have to jeopardize their health because they're concerned about returning. So I think that that needs to be addressed as well um, in the conversation. And lastly, I think that um, based on my conversations with people and, and my experience with um, what's happening on my own campus is almost like the campuses are kind of sovereign campuses, right? Everybody's going to do their own thing. And that from my perspective, there needs to be at least some general standards that people need to abide by. I know specifically for my campus, the recommendation was that reporting in terms of people coming in be self-reporting on a questionnaire, including their temperature. So that's of a concern to me because even though temperature may not be the only way to determine it and people can be asymptomatic, I think certain safeguards help and it still happens in the hospitals because I have gone to the doctor many times and they take your temperature. Um, and so I want to make sure that we're doing on our campuses across the university all of the things that make us feel better about coming on campus. Well, I want to thank you, Renee, because you're, you're really talking to the demands. Right. I mean, one of the demands has to do with people having the ability to remote work, um, and especially if they have people that are in their homes that are vulnerable. So, um, so you basically laid it out of why these demands are so important. La I think it was Iris you were going to talk, or was it I? Very briefly, uh, uh, let me just, very briefly, because basically... Uh, uh, Renee and talked about it, but yes, the reasonable accommodations is an important issue, and I don't think it's one that's going to be easily won, by the way. I was just part of a nice board of directors meeting the other day where the legals were talking about, you know, what's going to happen if, if we are in that kind of a situation. I have a 94-year-old mother. You know, I myself have heart problems, and my diabetic, and I also have di um, uh, asthma problems. What does that mean? <laughs> Do I have a right to be able to protect my family? Excuse me. All right, I'm gonna mute her for a second, unless- No, I turned it off. 
Okay, go ahead. <laughs> uh, the power of the mute button. I love it. Go ahead. You know, so anyway, thank you for raising it because that was exactly where I was going. And, and I think, you know, if there's one thing that we really have to be stand solidly behind are these types of things because it's not going to be an easy battle. And as you say, it's decentralized. People at different campuses will do whatever and depending on the culture. So we need to really be speaking with one voice regardless of who it is. Thank you, Iris. Larry, did you have something you wanted to say? Yeah, I actually, um, Asami, thank you for bringing up about the way the structure of the offices are because yeah, a lot of them are built on top of each other and they deal directly with the public. But another aspect that was brought to my attention a few days ago, my colleagues, Brooklyn College actually houses Brooklyn College Academy, which is a high school yeah. on campus. And it's right in one of the administrative buildings itself. So even though there's talk about that we're going to be doing sort of a stage um, we entry eventually, these high school kids will be coming on campus probably within the next three to four weeks. And some of the staff members express concerns what protocols are in place to deal with students from high schools that are going to be stationed at their campus, especially as we discovered, um, they have their own special rules that are determined by the DOE, not by CUNY or anyone else. So that's something else that's not being factored in, or at least not being expressed to the members. So I don't know if we, did we read the, the actual comment that saved the demand? So I, I'd like to just read it and then we can continue. The, fir, the, this, the, num, the ones we're talking about now are saved lives. Um, I, I guess I'll read it. Is that okay? So uh, CUNY, CUNY must immediately comply with the New York State requirement that universities engage with unions representing their employees in developing plans for reopening. Major issue that the university has not been willing to negotiate with us. So none of the, we're, we're talking about all these issues, they're like this, and we're going to do what we want to do. And that is a major, major concern. Second one is before CUNY requires a single employee to return for on-site, CUNY must publicly present a plan for full compliance at every open work site with federal and New York state health and safety guidelines regarding COVID-19. With all relevant federal guidelines and with parties collective bargaining agreement concerning workplace safety. Drawing in all the unions, not just the PSC, all the unions were asking for. And number three, CUNY must agree that even after on-site work resumes, the university will provide accommodation, including permission to continue remote work for employees at risk of serious illness or death as a result of contracting COVID-19. So with that said, I just wanted to remind us where we're focus is. So um, John, I think you had a so, something you wanted to say? Yeah, I mean, I, if I were, if I would be perfectly upfront about this, if I were the chancellor, I wouldn't want us coming back to work because I think we're working more. I mean, my team, we start our Slack channel up at 630 in the morning yeah. and we work straight through the time we would commute. We have about, you know, five, six heos working easily 50 hours a week without any extra compensation. We don't take a yeah, and then I'm gonna <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna just step in there as the chapter no, chair to not. say that that's a violation of the contract, the contract and yeah. that that needs to be addressed. Exactly. Well, they need no, those people right. that are working yeah. fifty hours a week should not be working fifty hours a week, and they need to file a grievance with contract enforcement. And if anybody okay. and you can my my email address is on the website, Indeed. but we need to we need to or we need to have an active um, yeah. organizing event to prevent people to do that. And if people I, I, say I, that they are not willing, that they're afraid, then they're going to give their life over to CUNY. Right. But I hear what you're saying. And John, I'm gonna let you get, I, I'm sorry, I had to cut you off, John. I guess I did my power thing. So I'm gonna let you talk, John, go ahead. Well, yeah, but I mean, the thing is we're getting phone calls at 6.30, 7 o'clock in the morning from panicky faculty who need to get their courses online. Mm -hmm. It's not like we're getting phone calls from our dean or our supervisor. We're getting panicky phone calls from faculty. And it's like, we're not going to turn, especially adjuncts, we're not going to say, I don't work till nine o'clock. We're just going to pick up the ball and do it. Well, okay. So I hear what you're saying, but I think if you're working at nine o'clock, then you have to stop at, 
at five o'clock. Yeah. But, but you know, and, and part of what we do as union leaders is to really sort of encourage people to be brave enough to say to somebody, this is, you know, we, we work 35 hours a week. Um, and Ann Selma is going to talk a little bit about that. Actually, I wanted Selma to present on setting boundaries because I think that's something that we really need to do. But she didn't, we couldn't do it today. But Ann Selma, why don't you talk a little bit about that? Well, uh, I want to say that uh, I gave myself ten, ten. I, I want to say something quickly about safe lives. Uh, one of the issues that concern me working at 25 Broadway is that we do not have a nurse or any counsel or anything. And we had had a couple of times when I had to call 911 because someone got sick. I think this is something that moving forward, any CUNY unit should have someone that we could refer our students to. But going back about setting limits, uh, many years ago, Iris will remember this because she really was a supporter of us. We started telling kiosks, uh, I forget what the slogan we came up with, it, it, take your lunch, we, we will pay for it or something like that. <laughs> yeah. Those were complaining that they were walking through the lunch yeah, at your computers and it. people were coming. And we, we did a little research and it really impacts your health. It yeah. really causes a lot of health issues that I don't have time to go into it. So as part of my presentation for professional etiquette that I did for, for students, we talked about setting sending boundaries, if for no other reason for your own health, because it does have an impact, I can try to make it and do the research that backs it up. Uh, but I think we have to remember that we're really not on call 24 seven. If for no other reason contract, yes, it's in the contract, but we also send the contract that we should be paid over time. Kios, uh, I don't know, we have the Mother Teresa complex, I guess, or the Savior uh, oh, complex. Man. It's too By the yeah. way, charge. I'm gonna, but but we have to say for if we know the reason for our own health. Talk about safe lives. Okay, we're moving. We got to move on now to the next one because we spent a lot of time. But I hear what you're saying. There's a lot of heos out there that want to work more hours for free, and we're we're the union, so we're saying don't work for free. You have to let have those conversations with people, even faculty that want us to work. 24 7 we can't do it and cindy, you get it yeah cindy just from a historical perspective perspective i think some that we got some new people here don't know this part of it but you know the overtime the working overtime situation if if you're not if they're asking for you to work beyond your hours then it has to be made clear that they're going to pay for that overtime we had nine heels that put their stability on the line when we had, we call them the Brave La Guardia Nine, and we had that overtime provision that are, are the heels, are, they're the biggest challenge to us enforcing this because as long as mm -hmm. you're willing to do it, they're willing to take it and you are establishing a past practice. Mm -hmm. We should not be gifting our time. If they want it, we have to have, be paid for it. And, yeah, that's about okay, it. Larry's going to raise his hand. I'm, I'm, I'm feeling the, the yeah. heat of the room, so I'm <laughs> yes. going to let Larry talk, and then we're going to move after that. I, Go I'm going to make this quick, because I know we need to go to the next up. I don't think it's the issue of the managers asking staff to work over time. I think because of the fact that we're all working remotely, we're getting additional responsibilities in mm -hmm. order to do it. Um, you have to do that extra time. I'm not saying that they should be. Definitely, I agree that we are giving away time. But they feel in a way that in order to get the job or keep things moving, they have to, I've spoken to heels, they said they work to midnight. I've spoken to heels that said they, yeah, started at six in the morning, work weekends to get just their basic nine to five job done. So I don't think it's an issue of uh, them being asked to do. I think part of it is the Mother Teresa complex. Like, I want to help the student. I want to help my colleague. But at the same time, I think it is built in. I need to do this in order to get things done. But it's yeah. a call to, it's it's a a to that we have, that we have, we are enabled. And, and I'm, by the way, I'm guilty. I used to come mm -hmm. to work Saturdays. My sister used to say, you're so stupid. But we have, we have done that culture. And, and I think at some point we had to stop. Okay, yeah. good. And on that note, let's go to the next um, area. So would somebody like to read the save jobs section, if you have it handy? Get a little diversity of voices in here. Anybody have it? Yeah, sure, I have it here. Okay, Larry, you're gonna do it? 
Oh, I'll do it. Okay. Um, save jobs. Adjunct faculty and staff, graduate employees, continuing education teachers, and CLIP and CUNY start instructors and any other PSC represented employees laid off in 2020 for budgetary or programmatic reasons must be reinstated in their positions or in comparable positions with no loss of accrued benefits. All PSC represented employees who have lost or will lose eligibility for health insurance because of budgetary or programmatic layoffs must be restored to eligibility with no loss of coverage. And last but not least, CUNY management and CUNY research foundation management must stop stonewalling and engage with urgency in impact bargaining with the PSC and must reach agreement on remaining demands by August 26. Okay, thank you so much. So I said I would talk a little bit about this. And the only way I can think about this is I think historically of the number of full-time faculty that we had in universities across the country 20 years ago, 25 years ago, 15 years ago. And because public higher education has been defunded by state and federal governments, um, less money came in. And as a result, most universities relied on adjunct teaching. Now we have uh, almost a majority of part-time adjunct teachers. And the position of the PSC is, if you are going to run the college on part-time employees, they have to have a living wage and they have to be supported. And so he owes, you know, the benefits of not cutting adjuncts is that adjuncts are, have history with their students and with their campus. And when you fire them, you don't even have the part-time people and they have more people. Hopefully you, the university won't just take students and put them into giant Zoom rooms where they can meet with one professor and there's hundreds of people. I am the director of counseling at City Tech and I know that system doesn't work because a professor needs to connect with their student. And when you cut adjuncts, you're then saying, okay, we're gonna cut higher education, get rid of the full-time faculty, make the college run on adjuncts, and then we're gonna even cut the adjuncts. That's what's happened with higher education. Um, what else did I wanna say? When you cut non-teaching adjuncts, that's where you hit the, the heel. Because when you cut these positions, what happens in CUNY is all of a sudden, there's all these responsibilities and no one. So what do they do? They take a full-time job and they put it onto another person and they say, you now have two jobs and you have to maintain them. Or they say, well, we'll re reclassify you in about two years and maybe give you a raise. And if we know, as we know, there's a hiring freeze. So I, I really feel that the idea of cutting part-time workers actually adds to our work because then we get it. And as we know, there's that little tiny line at the bottom of our job description, any duties as assigned. And it's happening over and over again. And that's why we have all that overtime issue. So does anybody else want to say anything about well, yeah, save jobs. Yes, Marie, Mary, you're on mute. Uh, yes, um, you know, the concern for me is, and I, I, I understand around in many of the colleges around CUNY, um, as a counselor, we have, you know, full-time uh, full counselors. And then we have a bunch of adjuncts who it's, we, we cannot determine, uh, you know, uh, it cannot be confirmed that they will be allowed to stay with us past each month. So it's almost like they'll have a monthly contract, which is not count, which is not possible to do to have in a counseling center because, as you say, Cindy, professors have relationships with their students, and and also counselors have relationships with their students at least for a semester. So it it, you know, it just seems like there's no understanding of the relationship and the and the you know the the kind of work we do with our students who at this time are experiencing such extreme. Um, issues, uh, you know, they're, uh, they're living remotely. Um, they're, you know, many students tell me that they really miss the campuses and going to their classes, which they didn't ever think about before. They just thought, okay, you know, take it for granted. But now they're, they're feeling very isolated. They don't have the contact with the professors as much as they used. 
and they don't have the kind of in-person interaction and collegiality with their fellow students. So, so that, that's one big issue that, that I see going forward even, um, and it's becoming much more um, of a concern now. The other, the other area is for, you know, nurse practitioners. Um, uh, you know, what's going to happen with nurse practitioners? It's almost impossible to get a contract with those people. And there is an increasing number of students. I mean, just a very recent st study showed that they, a huge increase in the number of student, students seeking uh, mental health services. So all of these things need to be taken into account. And, and I'm sure others of you have, have other issues around this, uh, this, uh, this topic. Yeah, um, I think Janet, you were raising your hand. Oh, just something quick. I was speaking to a HEO today who runs a tutoring center and all his tutors uh, receive non-reappointment letters. So, I mean, that's a tremendous issue. Um, so yeah. that affects yeah. HEOs and students, of course. Very, yes, that, sort of absolutely. Absolutely. John and then Renee. Yeah, I just have to say, I mean, I have to give Barbara Bowen and the rest of the EC a lot of credit here because we spent the past 20 years doing pretty incredible things to make adjuncts' lives a lot better. I mean, we got we get managed to get them health care under Mayor Bloomberg. We got pretty close to 7K. We got the three-year contracts. We're not giving any of that back. I mean, if, if they succeed in doing layoffs, essentially we're giving back 20 years of real accomplishments that we, we can't give back. I mean, though, I mean, you know, we tend to hear a lot of people saying that it wasn't enough. Yeah, we didn't get enough, but we're not going to give the victories we got back. I mean, I think we all feel pretty strongly about that, that we got adjunct health care under Mayor Bloomberg was a pretty considerable accomplishment. And no one better lose health insurance right now. That's, that's like, we just have to stick to our guns. Um, well said, well said, Renee, and then Iris. So I wanted to say that um, looking at it from the perspective of job loss, I think that um, it's important for us to recognize that losing jobs impacts our student success as well as their engagement. So right. you talk about, you know, students who are adjuncts who may lose their jobs or college assistants that are losing their jobs. Um, the impact is not only that the, the work is, is they're going to attempt to shift the work, but it has to be a reduction in service and a reduction in the number of students that are engaged and, and that are gonna be retained because the students really need to have that connection. And, they, and we also need to be able to deliver the types of support services um, that those students need. So if we're losing jobs, then we're having an impact on the quality of the education and we're having an impact on the support um, that we're able to provide to students from a service perspective. The other thing I wanted to say is that um, someone talked about nurse practitioners. Um, I can say it on LaGuardia's campus, we have, um, we had two EMTs and we had a nurse. So they laid off one of the EMTs because there's, they, there's no justification for them right now remotely to retain that person. But when you look at transitioning back, how, what's that going to look like? I mean, the health services at that point would be kind of central to ensuring that, you know, folks are meeting um, the standards of COVID. If people are sick, what do we do with them? How do we report them out? What kinds of strategies are going to be in place for that? So I think job loss um, is going to have a direct impact on the university, the quality of the education that's provided as well as the quality of the services, and most importantly, enrollment and retention. Yeah, I agree. I totally agree. I think that one of the, one of the groups that's hardest hit by this entire remote work are the enrollment management people, the people that have to, in, to bring people into the college remotely. Um, the pressure on these people is out is beyond anything I've ever seen. They're working way too long and they shouldn't be. And I'm telling them that they shouldn't be. They have a 35 hour work week. I guess I just want to go back to that because I really feel like the people in the registrar, financial aid, financial aid is hurting. Registrar, transfer, the transfer office. I, um, there's so much, so many people that are working nonstop to get students in. 
And um, I think there was, um, Iris, you were going to say something. Oh, okay. Well, well, well said, Cindy. You know, we as advisors, as counselors, as people that deal with students at all levels when, they, when they're first coming into the university and then we help them get registered and then, you know, we go before any professor gets a student, they have to go through one of us first in every area of the university, right? But I will say to you that this last three months, four months, and even before, and even before, the level of um, engagement with students uh, as they face economic straits, as they face all kinds of different problems. Um, many times talking to people that were in shelters and, you know, I mean, you, you, got, you run the gamut, so you know what I'm talking about. And um, at a time like this, when everybody is needed at the university to provide the kind of services that is required that we're supposed to be providing our students, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I think there's two things that we have to look at when we think about job losses. Number one, prematurely losing people as we did before it even had to happen. That's a political decision. They say it was budgetary, but you know what? It didn't have to happen yet because we still don't know what is coming down from the federal stimulus packages. So to be the first ones to, to start cutting people at a time when we absolutely need everybody on board was ridiculous. And it just speaks to a lot of things. I won't say what I think about the chancellor at this point, but you know, let's just say that I'm quite disappointed. But for the other part, even if we have a budgetary situation, we have to be careful and look forward, look, move, look forward to what we think could be coming down the line. I mean, for the HEO chapter, for example, and I'm not saying that this is, you know, part of this thing, but it, it does deal with the question of people uh, replacing full-timers with part-timers and changing the, the, the status of a full-time heel to a part-time heel. I just want to caution everybody about this. You know, this could happen. This could happen. And we have to be very careful about that because we will have a tremendous increased workload and the support services that we have to provide our students will definitely suffer dramatically from that. But I don't want to get off that because that's a different issue than what we're talking about, but it's something that we have to be aware of. Okay, you know? very good. And Selma? So I want to say that uh, we, we, all have been, uh, we all have been the victim of austerity, austerity policy that Albany has played with us and that we seem to not to have a lot of support from King Central. And I think that uh, I have been doing community outreach work for the last three years in earnest. I, I think we have to be mindful of the effect that this has in the community. Our student being first generation by and large, and also working class, I don't care from all walks of life, but working class, we serve, uh, you know, heels in particular, doing the, the front line and then faculty, of course, we serve not more, we serve more than one role. We, in many cases, we are the mentors, we are the liaison, we are the key. And this has an impact on the rest of the community, the very community that we are supposed to be empowering and helping. So saving jobs is more than just saving the jobs for one person, but it has this triple effect into the community right. that affects the students, the parents, and a future generation that might decide I, I, I cannot make it because there's no help there for me. Right now, I'm trying to help out some students that are reaching out to me. I sent to Samina a picture where I have Shamika, Shanika, and I think another student that came to one of my immigration, uh, immigration uh, workshops that I did with CUNY, CUNY uh, uh, Citizenship for CUNY. And uh, anyway, I just want to say that there's a direct connection to our community. So when we lose a job, it's not just that one person that loses a right. job. It has this triple effect into the community. And CUNY has to be mindful. Albany has to be mindful about that. Yeah, and, and the CLIP program, I think I, I guess I want to do a shout out to the CLIP program, CUNY yeah. START, and the BEOC program that actually work with our students to get them ready to be at college level because many of our students can't do that. Uh, they're not at college level. And so those programs that got cut 
that uh, now BEOC has not been cut, um, but the CLIP program and CUNY START, those are prep programs that bring students up to the level so that then they can start at college level. And to cut them is, is extremely um, awful, just an awful situation. Yeah, John. Yeah, I'm just gonna say that in the contract before the last one, getting the CUNY START workers a living wage was to be one of our most significant accomplishments. And yeah, I, I see Iris nodding her head that, you know, that CUNY really wanted to screw those CUNY STAR teachers. And we went to bat for them. And that's another thing we can't give back. You know, we, we cannot give back significant gains that we've actually won. So we need to make sure those people stay on payroll. Well, I think that's part of the uh, Save Jobs demand. So luckily the PSC is just right in there fighting for them because they're actually <laughs> named. So I want to see if we can move on to the next the next one. Is that okay with everybody? Yes. Unless somebody has a burning issue they want to say? Okay. Save CUNY. Um, I think we were going to have, uh, is it Samina and John were going to talk about that. So one of you want to read? You want to start us off? Sure, John. Uh, CUNY must include faculty governance bodies, including department chairs, and where appropriate, the PSC as participants in decisions about curriculum and the modality of instruction consistent with compliance and the health and safety requirements above. CUNY must bargain with the PSC on class size. CUNY must freeze tuition for the 2020-2021 academic year and eliminate the proposed wellness fee. CUNY must present a public plan for addressing the health emergency faced by its students, including a plan for increasing the number of full-time mental health counselors for students to meet nationally mandated staffing ratios. So this is where um, I would make a slight edit and instead of saying, saying save CUNY, I would say fight for CUNY, which I think is very much the tenor of this conversation. Um, uh, I, I feel that these 10 demands really um, strike or really um, put their put their dukes up in terms of um, uh, ensuring that um, our mission is not eroded. It's not um, chipped away at. Um, and I know just in terms of the conversation that is happening here that there is so much care and so much concern and commitment to um, the, the CUNY mission and to our CUNY student body. Um, I'm gonna just jump into um, one of the, the things that I'm interested in talking about, um, faculty governance providing ongoing training to student-facing ed educators. So um, at, my, uh, at my work site, the School of Labor and Urban Studies, um, we are in this really interesting position, which I think many, uh, many CUNY students and staffers are in where we are very much an organizing in-person college um, where um, even education uh, has an organizing sensibility. Um, you know, students are in classrooms, students are making, um, building relationships with each other. They are building um, relationships with their faculty and, and HEOs so that um, we're all kind of thinking toward um, professional, academic, and activist um, goal making and goal building. Um, so when we moved to online education, I think one question that we, uh, some heels and faculty were, were kind of thinking about is how do we maintain those connections and how do we build those connections online when it can be so alienating? Um, so uh, some heels were able to push to get um, some online training uh, that faculty, full-time faculty were able to get. Um, and so it's been, I'm, I was lucky to be one of those folks and it is a game changer. Um, it has really opened my mind as to how I can work so much better with my students online. And I want to say, I would like fully advocate that any student facing um, staffer or faculty person, adjuncts, TOs, um, our amazing IT people, um, you know, um, at, you know, everyone who is, is working with students have that opportunity to have that professional development and training so that we can really um, be there for, we can show up for our students in ways that will serve them um, and, and engage them and, and also respect that they themselves bring uh, a really interesting 
um, expertise in the in digital technology, um, especially if they're younger. Um, I turn it up to over to John. Well, I mean, one thing I feel pretty strongly about is that faculty governance and unions are part of governance came out of the end of the 19th century with John Dewey, because universities that are about creating and transmitting knowledge are too complicated for any administrator to grasp. I mean, the chancellor could be the nicest guy in the world. He has no idea what a respiratory therapy teacher does. He has no idea what an English professor does. He can only guess. He needs that governance to make it work. And the same thing goes for somebody who's doing counseling, someone who's doing, like I was a Sikh student. I mean, I'm very proud I was a Sikh student. Those Sikh counselors took kids who came from incredibly bad circumstances and got them up to where they needed to get at very high rates. But their vice president for student affairs had no idea what they did. And I still think they don't know what they do. So this governance is about better outcomes. And John Dewey started the trade union movement in higher education and he started the governance movement. And in order for the chancellor to get good outcomes, he needs to talk to us. And he needs to talk to us as a collective, not as individuals, but as a group. Because we will give them better ideas on how to save this university. They're not going to get it from Jamie Dimon. Jamie Dimon is not going to do crap for us. I mean, all these, all this, this whole thing he's coming. I mean, I was really kind of very disturbed when I saw the chancellor with Jamie Dimon on the front page of the newspaper the other day. Great that he's getting that support. But if he wants to save the university, he has to talk to faculty. He has to talk to staff and he has to talk to the PSC because we're the only people who can give him the knowledge and the, and, and, and the insights he needs to do his job. And, you know, the fact that they've been ignoring us and shutting us out is just going to mean we're going to go through what we went through last time we went through like a fiscal crisis with retrenchment where they made stupid decisions. I mean, really stupid decisions. And that hurt the university to this day. So we need to, be, they need to listen. I mean, I'm sorry to get so excited about this, but I've seen this university get trashed three times in my lifetime. And every time we got trashed, it took 20 years to get us out of the hole. I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to turn back. I, don't, I mean, I only got, I don't got 20 more years to see the university climb its way out of the hole. So I'll just leave it at that. I want Renee and then Anselma. So, um... I want to say under the topic of Save CUNY, it needs to be inclusive. And so here is where I think the heels need to be front and center along with faculty. On LaGuardia's campus, governance includes all factions of PSC. So it's not just a Senate that includes faculty, it includes faculty and heels and CLTs. So I think when we talk about governance, we have to talk about all the constituents of governance, and we can't just focus it on one dimension of governance. I also think that inclusive in um, professional development, I absolutely agree with Samina, um, and she said that people had, the heels had to fight. I mean, just think about that for a minute. We are significant members of the City University of New York's operation, and we had to fight to be trained and many times management and others don't know the digital divide. So the expectation was that everyone just jump on Google to find the platform and get it going the next day. And the reality is there is a huge div digital divide and there has not been any professional development in terms of technology and the platforms. Um, across LaGuardia's campus, and I'm sure it holds true across many of our campuses. So from my perspective, if we don't put ourselves up front and the expectation of lifting the university is on the backs of the heels, then it's not going to work. They have to recognize the work that we do. They have to recognize the need for training. They have to understand what it took to put an infrastructure up from nothing. 
in order for us to really deliver the services to students. They have to understand what it took to engage students, to engage on those platforms, to connect to the databases that don't connect to the database that CUNY on 365 gives us. They need to really understand that if they want this university to function, it has to be inclusive of all of its constituents. So Save CUNY can't just be about save one faction of CUNY. It has to be about save all of CUNY and all of its constituents, all of us who work there as well as our students. And thank you, Renee. That was very good. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> so I, I agree, Renee. I think that the that my one concern is that the, that someone will hear this and say, oh, and you got to get trained. And then on top of all their work, they got to go to training. We should be paid extra or let us go away for the weekend or give us something else besides just more work to get trained. But I think that your comments were excellent. Excellent. Now, yeah, who else would have their hand? I absolutely and, agree with that. Uh, sorry, uh, Cindy. Yeah. Uh, you and know, then Aunt there was a lot of training for um, faculty during the summer, specific training that was uh, made available. But it wasn't really convenient for HEALS to do that because yeah. that was the busy yeah. time for HEALS uh, in many of the programs. So they wouldn't have been able to do that. And if they did do any training, they ha we had to just pull off a, a, a schedule that was sent out by our OIT department yeah, yeah. when we were, when we had a little bit of time to do it. So it was at our own initiative, but nothing that was planned. So it just wasn't adequate at all. And, you know, going forward, uh, we've got over this um, emergency because of our own, you know, motivation and initiatives and just, uh, just uh, sheer doggedness. Uh, but there will be many other issues coming up and how, how is that being prepared for? Um, that's what I would like to see considered as we go forward. You know, Mary, and Selma, and so, Selma, and so, then Iris. So as a member of the Ledge Committee for many, many years, this one of the things that we have discussed is the fact that that PSC seems to be at, at odds with CUNY Central. And, and this is something that, that I'm wondering how, and, and I, I think John has been there when those discussions happened, I, and I've been wondering how can we have get PSC to uh, CUNY and PSC to talk to each other because we seem to be at odds at, at odds with each other and they do not seem to support CUNY doesn't seem to support what PSC does for as so was so eloquently said before. I remember one time that on the President Kimmick at at the Brooklyn College, he ordered these you know, this, uh, this uh, train, professional training, and it was college-wide, and, and it was one time, but we need to have an ongoing professional training, just like all the professionals needed, doctors needed, my acupuncturist needed. We need to be able to be, have professional training. Most of us, myself included, were not really prepared with this, uh, the demands that I made at all. I mean, I'm lucky that I can call people and say, can you help me with this? Can you help me with that? Uh, but but uh, I'll stop here. We need an ongoing professional training. And we also need to find a way to have CUNY on our side, PSC side. They don't seem to be on our side. So we need to somehow lobby, lobby uh, with the board of trustees. They don't seem to be on our side. It's like we are fighting ourselves so anyway yeah so, so John, has any John, idea? Wait, wait, wait. John, John's next and then somebody else had their hand up yeah I want to address Selma's point because this gets back to why the PSC is so important to CUNY you know I spent a lot of time as many of you have running up and down the state legislative office building and through the Capitol trying to get support and a couple of times I met one of our vice chancellors a couple of our vice chancellors and you know something they're grateful we're there they can't say they're grateful we're there but they're grateful because they work for the governor and the governor put his budget hatchet guy on our board of trustees. So they can't make the case for CUNY that CUNY needs because they work for Cuomo. So the bottom line is the PSC is essential to CUNY doing well because we could walk into the state legislative office building and say, you know, we need this. And then the vice chancellor will come like half an hour later and go, do you need this? And you can go, yeah, I do. 
the, I want to talk about that wellness fee though. You know, that wellness fee, we have to be very careful about that. We know the students need it. But the thing is, most of that wellness fee is now slated to go right to the central office. So I really want to know if they want to charge this fee, I don't think they should charge it. But if they want to charge this fee, they have to talk to the people in the PSC who do counseling, who do advising, who do mental health work and say, what are you going to do? What can you use this money for? Not just use it as a slush fund like they do with some of the other fees. You, you, know, you don't even want to know where half the fee money goes. And I'll uh -huh. just leave it at that. So I want to give Iris a chance. And then I think, Samina, you wanted to say something? And we have to probably wrap it up. That's what um, I mean. Okay, go ahead. If so, you so me, I will yeah, try. I guess, you know, we wanted to talk about what was at the end, um, the things that we felt were not really exactly. addressed and we, we still need to have addressed for HEO. So Iris, you want to start? And That's then maybe... exactly where I was going. And, okay. um, and I'm going to try to stick with the categories that were described, even for this particular thing. Mm -hmm. You know, we talk about um, a safe workplace. We often think about the things that we talked about today, you know, the sanitation that we should have, the, all the things that we should have so that we don't get infected in, in this particular moment. But there are other things that, that um, speak to a safe workplace and that's mental um, workplace, a thing where, you know, you are treated with dignity and respect regardless of whether you're working offline or you're working remotely or on the campus. And this is something that we really need to pay attention to because, for example, I can identify a good number of things whereby the health of mental health of many of our, of our members has been impacted by how much more reporting they're asked, being asked to do. Uh, John talked about the many more hours that people are working, and that's not because they don't know what they're doing, it's because we walked into some of these remote areas not having very often the technology uh, that was expected that we didn't need before but now was serious demands that we had to learn a lot of different programs i included i mean what normally would have taken me a regular work day extended dramatically because i had to learn different things that i didn't know before so that's one thing uh, also when you get evalu evaluations, which is part of this whole thing, how are heroes being evaluated at this point or any other worker? I mean, whether it's a faculty, I mean, there's evaluations, right? Uh, and um, so what is, the, what is the impact of those evaluations when these things are taken into consideration and should not be? If you are working remotely and all of a sudden you had to learn something that you didn't know and all of a sudden you have a supervisor that's gonna say, oh, you should know this or this, that or the other, you know, that could be you. So those, those are things that we have to watch out for. In terms of, um, you know, in this last round of bargaining, uh, we did have some kind of an ar arrangement, not necessarily in the contract, but a sidebar that had to do with the question of bullying at the workplace. These conditions lend itself for this kind of treatment. When people are most vulnerable, these things pop up and i just want to you know just say something about that at this moment i'm not going to go into it you all heard me about workplace bullying but i think that this is something that moving forward we cannot ignore anymore and so the question of technology the question of evaluations the question of a healthy workplace that covers not only um the things that are absolutely necessary to be able to walk into a safe environment in our jobs but also that deals with um the mental health that happens when people are judging you on things that you really didn't know before. So I will finish by saying that legislation is a big piece of what we have to do moving forward, regardless of what. We have to stand behind our union to support whatever it is that we need to do to defend these 10 demands. And beyond that, because this is not going to end beyond the 26th, Beyond that, we have to be prepared also to engage in the political um, movement that we have to be a part of. It cannot just be a few people in the legislation committee. It's going to take each and every one of us to partake, and you could do it in so many different ways. You don't have to go to Albany every time we go. We don't have to, you know, 
do fun back in every second, but we have to be a part of whatever it is that we're doing in whichever way you can. So that's my charge to you as someone that has been a member of this union. I love this union. I love being a part of everything that we're fighting for. Social justice is a big deal for us. It's not just a bread and butter thing. And the time has come mm -hmm. but for us to embrace that. You know, it's not just bread and butter. We have to fight for this because this is the political moment that we're in and we are facing real serious consequences with this budget. And if we don't all do this together, we're going to be screwed. Pardon the French, erase that. <laughs> but Irish, that was well said. And I, we have to end now because we're way over time that we had one hour. So I'm going to say that um, I think that that was so well spoken. I think that it's easy for us. It's easy to come onto a Zoom room and talk. Mm -hmm. We now got to do the walk. We need to get out and organize other people to get involved. And if you're watching this through the recording, this is your sort of shout out that you need to help us. We can't just do it ourselves. So with that, I wanted to say thank you to all of you that helped us get this together. And um, I am so grateful for everybody. And we're gonna end with uh, me saying goodbye and all of us saying goodbye. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you, organizers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Samina for organizing it. Merlene for organizing it. Thank you so much.